Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, we are starting a new chapter today. We have finished Egypt and we are moving into the Mediterranean. We are going to talk about Cycladic art in this short lecture and then the next lecture will be about Minoan culture and art and then the last part will be about Mycenaean. This all serves as precursor, sort of, to Greek art which we will look at after the midterm. On this timeline I have put a cycladic work of art, the seated harp player, and something that we'll look at next time, which is the Nosos Palace complex of Minoan civilization, just to sort of show you that there's not a lot here, and we are working with limited information. These next few lectures are actually going to be similar to Neolithic art, in which we don't really have a lot of information and there's a lot of speculation. Cycladic art actually refers to art that comes from this little island group known as the Cyclades. And you can see that it's off the mainland of Greece. Uh, and then it is north of this giant island of Crete, which is the next lecture about the Minoan civilization. There were many Neolithic settlements on these islands during the early Bronze Age, from about 3000 to 2000 BCE. There are two specific islands, Paros and Naxos, that were used as the source of marble for most of the sculpture that we'll look at today. An interesting thing is that most works of art are found from shipwrecks, and that's because this is a seafaring culture. This is actually the first civilization that we've studied that doesn't revolve around a river. And this idea of having to travel from place to place on a boat will create interesting things in the evolution of the art of this whole region because they'll have to share ideas because of the way they move around. This is a map of the Persian Empire and just like chronology I want geographically to help you understand where we are. Look at how giant that Persian Empire is and then you have this tiny little group of islands. But eventually the art from this area becomes the art that spreads across the world. There's lessons to be learned, I think, in this idea that a very small part of the world can make a giant impact on the rest of it. Okay, back to the art. Archaeologists have found around 1,400 marble figurines, and much of the information about these things have been, has been lost. Uh, many of them were looted from tombs because there was this push in black market antiquities. People at some point in the recent history loved these things and everybody wanted them. There were only a few engraves and they maybe had a mark of status. Many have been painted and patterns have been recovered using controlled lighting and microscopic investigation. By the way, I just want to put a disclaimer out there that there is not a lot of information in the world about cycladic art. The way that I researched this was I used the book that I didn't make you buy. So if anybody did buy that book, I might be repeating things and I apologize. Okay, disclaimer over. Like I said, there were a lot of painted features on these little marble figurines. And by using these microscopic investigations and controlled lighting, they found things like painted staring eyes. And there is conjecture that these eyes might have been a way to connect the figures to those who owned or used them. There's even a theory that the eyes that were located on other places other than the faces were supposed to aim the viewer's attention to a particular area of the body. Some of these sculptures had eyes on the bellies and they think that might have been about pregnancy. One of the reasons that um, there was such a market for these things uh, not too long ago is because of the minimalistic tendencies. All of the body parts are pared down to essentials and some joints are just indicated with incised lines. My favorite part about these things, one of the interesting things, is that they were carefully designed using a compass to create three evenly spaced and equally sized circles. And this diagram shows you that. The first delineated by the upper arch of the head and the waist, the second by the sloping shoulders and the line of the knees, and the third beginning with the curving limit of the feet and meeting at the bottom of the upper circle at the waist there weren't lines in these things, someone figured this out. There are a few of these sculptures that are of musicians. This is a seated harp player. There's another famous one of a pipe player. And they date to approximately 2500 BCE. 
And these musicians are sometimes considered the earliest surviving musician depictions from the Aegean. Interest in these kinds of minimalistic figures actually peaked in the early to mid 20th century because they looked like works of art from modern sculptors like Jean Arp and Brancusi. And there's this quality of purity, minimalism, and movement that really appealed to artists of that time. If the musicians are the most coveted and famous, the most common type of schematic representation of the human body in early Cycladic art were these figurines that look like violins to us. They're actually squatting women, and we know this because several examples of this kind of sculpture feature an incised pubic triangle and, less frequently, modeled breasts. So we have taken examples of these shapes that, that have female features and basically decided that these all represent squatting female women. All right, so what did they do with these things? What did they mean? What happened with these things? Well, I don't really know. But there are some ideas. So first, they could have been idols of gods. They could have been used as images of death. They could have been children's dolls. There are a number of ideas. Here's another one. A lot of these had been painted with mineral-based pigments like azurite for blues or iron ores or cinnabar for red. And many of them had these patterns of vertical red lines that were painted on the faces. And some figures possibly were related to cycladic rituals of mourning their dead. Here's how they think this worked. Sculptures were used in relation to a succession of key moments throughout the owner's lifetime, such as puberty, marriage, and death. And then they were continually repainted with these motifs that were associated with each ritual before finally following their owners into their graves at death. So these were kind of life markers. These were dolls you had for life that marked the passage of your life. An interesting thing, too, is that the feet are always bent forward, so they can't stand on their own. So people believe that they were either always carried or laid down. One um, speculation is that they were more than dolls and probably less than idols. Some show signs of repair, meaning that they would have been used by people in their daily lives. This is the last slide that we have for the Cycladic art. I told you this is a short one. Okay, this is not actually a frying pan. In fact, I think it's more similar to the palette of Narmer that we looked at in ancient Egypt, but I like this thing, so I want to talk about it. So it's basically a terracotta disc. Terracotta is a baked clay kind of thing, which we will talk about a lot more when we get to um, Rome. Um, the, they believe that this was a, a fertility charm. My favorite hypothesis on this is that Basically, what we're looking at is the back or the bottom, and if you flip it over, it's just uh, it's just like a bowl. And the idea this is a early form of a mirror, because when you fill the shallow depression on the other side with water, you can, if it's still, you can use it as a reflection. That's all I got for the Cyclades. I will work hard to formulate some sort of lecture question for this. We'll see what happens. 